It's our honor to be speaking with Francis Fitzgerald. Francis Fitzgerald is a renowned author and journalist and author of the text that we'll be discussing today, The Evangelicals, The Struggle to Shape America, available from Simon Schuster. Francis Fitzgerald, thank you so much for your willingness to speak to us today. Well, thank you for inviting me. Uh, Francis Fitzgerald, you've written a number of acclaimed books, including the Pulitzer Prize winning Fire in the Lake, The Vietnamese and the Americans in Vietnam, published in 1972. Many of your works have focused on the Vietnam War or American political history. Why did you decide to write a book on the evangelical movement? Actually, I've always been interested in evangelicals as a part of uh, American history, really. I, I, th I think I started um, by reading Richard Hofstadter on the subject, but then um, um, uh, I, so that sort of, it slightly entered into um, other books uh, that I wrote um, in an indir indirect ways. But um, I began this particular project um, by writing pieces for the New Yorker magazine. And the first was as early as 1980. I actually, it was by, by accident too, because, um, I was uh, t in Lynchburg, Virginia, teaching at a, um, at a, a liberal arts college there. And the professor said, um, you're a New Yorker, you probably never met a fundamentalist before, which is certainly was the case. And, he, and uh, uh, he said, you must go to this church across the way. Well, it happened to be Jerry Falwell's church. And Falwell at that moment was launching the moral majority. So um, it was an obvious, uh, article for the New Yorker. And um, um, the piece I did was less um, uh, Falwellian politics than, than um, um, uh, a sort of community study. Um, how did people get there? Um, uh, what, what was fundamentalism for them? And um, um, uh, what was this? How did they, how did they um, live in the context of uh, Lynchburg itself. And so, The questions you raise in the book are interesting to very many of us. Your book traces out the evangelical movement, the history of the evangelical movement from the first and second great awakenings back in the 18th and 19th centuries, and then focuses on the rise of the Christian right, particularly in the second half of the 20th century. If you would please, how do you define evangelical for the purposes of your study? Well, obviously, it's a religious term. Um, it, evangel uh, uh, comes from the Greek, uh, the gospel, the good news. And um, uh, I def define it, I've just sort of somewhat copied um, David Bebbington's uh, um, uh, criteria for um, what evangelicals have in common, which frankly is not that much, um, but um, it is a high view of the Bible. Um, a focus on, on Christ's death on the cross as, uh, as a means to salvation, um, the uh, need for, uh, to be born again um, as an adult, and uh, the need to evangelize. Your book also chronicles an associated movement, not identical, but associated, and that is the fundamentalists. The uh, Chicago American historian of religion, George Marsden, once quipped that a fundamentalist is an evangelical who's angry about something. That may or may not be a helpful definition. How do you uh, define fundamentalism for the purpose of your study? Well, I think Marsden's always right, <laughs> including on this point. Um, but um, I would say that um, I, there are two clues that I look for. Um, um, you know, they're doctrinal. And one of them is um, uh, premillennial dispensationalism, um, uh, essentially um, the belief that, uh, that um, Christ will come um, any, any moment and uh, deliver true Christians into the air. Um, the tribulations will affect the rest of the world and um, they will end with the Battle of Armageddon in which Christ's army will defeat the, uh, the beast and the Antichrist and um, uh, um, inaugurate the millennial reign of Christ on earth. 
to be followed by um, uh, the kingdom of God. That's, that's one. one. And then, that's uh, help me out. What would the probably, second point? Probably, probably the most important one, though, is, is the inerrant Bible. The belief that um, every sort of jot and tittle in, in the Bible is, is absolutely true. And, um, uh, of course, um, people interpret these jots and tittles in their own way, but they don't like to think for themselves as doing that. They like to think that they're, that this is, um, it's, it's, uh, uh, that, that every word has meant the same thing to everybody um, down through the centuries. Thank you so much. Francis Fitzgerald, your story uh, shows the beginnings of evangelicalism in these great awakenings, and then this really big disruption in the early part of the 20th century, what historians call the fundamentalist modernist conflict. Uh, what is happening in that moment? What, um, what, what exactly is this conservative form of Christianity confronting in this modernist conflict? Well, um, modernists um, tended to um, accept uh, Darwin, accept nat nat natural selection, and uh, uh, to um, really change the, uh, the, 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 a lot of the message, it became much more about, um, um, about, about um, uh, love and uh, 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 fellow feeling. I, they they um, were much less uh, defensive about um, other face. And um, um, they a um, whole lot of whole lot of changes um, uh, in the sense of um, um, belief that uh, uh, there was progress and and uh, perhaps too much belief in progress because I mean it took until Rein Reinhold Niebuhr um, until uh, um, they uh, people decided in the liberal churches that uh, the progress was not inevitable and uh, you know that, that things went badly from time to time okay but you know um, the fundamentalists um, tended to mirror them and and, and uh, um, you know it, they, they describe themselves as pursuing the the the, the ancient faith um, and the modernists as, as going astray from it but in fact um, uh, premillennialism, premillennial dispensationalism is a, an entirely new um, uh, uh, doctrine and it was formed in the 19th century. And uh, similarly, um, this absolute um, um, certainty about, um, uh, about the truth of the Bible, um, that's also really 19th century. Um, you know, you can find some of it going back to uh, the, the Reformation, but um, um, uh, the insistence upon it, um, uh, I think, um, um, uh, really uh, came out of this uh, bitter fight between the two two factions of evangelicalism at the time, and um, um, also uh, um, a tendency to um, um, a sort of aggression. I mean, it, it was um, you know they they wanted to take over the. Uh, the, um, the Presbyterian, the Baptist churches, and uh, they nearly succeeded. Um, and when they didn't, um, they went into kind of um, isolation um, and withdrawing from um, other Protestants as well as everybody else, you know. So um, people forgot about them for a long time um, because they simply seemed to go away, you know. Um, and um, you know, um, uh, the beloved figure such as William Jennings Bryan did what many considered making a fool of himself when he went around um, uh, denouncing Darwin and saying it shouldn't be uh, taught in the schools and so forth. Um, so so um, um, it really was a crisis. And I think that, um, that um, I, uh, not just fundamentalists, but um, the people we now call evangelicals are um, were affected by it, and uh, it it made them um, think that that um, they were kind of alone in the in the world, and and that everybody else was against them. Hmm. 
Thank you so much, Francis Fitzgerald, for this uh, portrait of the fundamentalist modernist conflict as you read it. Um, you've highlighted the role of Darwinism in as sort of an intellectual base or basis for this modernist movement. Are there other principal tenets to it, or is modernism essentially um, this conflict with Dar Darwinism? Well, I mean, it's, it's one of them, but the other other important one was um, the uh, the new readings of the Bible that uh, uh, came from Germany mostly, um, and that and. Uh, the idea was that you, you, you read the Bible as any other ancient um, volume by, by looking at um, the history that around, around when it was written and um, you find out what, what, what um, uh, books were written when. Uh, it wasn't done all, all, of, a, all of a piece. And um, you look at uh, the literature, the other literature of the time and and see what the influences were um, on it, and uh, it it, um, um, uh, it puts it into a, a, a larger context and framework. And whereas um, I think that the conservative evangelicals at that time, because they weren't yet fundamentalists, um, simply t tended to uh, accept the Bible as sort of given by God all at once, and um, that was it, um, and uh, the the um, evangelists who wrote it down were were, were um, important, but but uh, really only translators of what God was saying. Francis Fitzgerald, thank you so much for those comments. After this fundamentalist modernist conflict, which you document and, and uh, explain in your book, we have this period of separatism. Billy Graham, following this period, claims to be politically neutral throughout his career, and some commentators would even argue that Graham showed clearer political, political leanings towards the De Democratic Party than he did the Republican Party. When and how did um, the American evangelical scene become broadly aligned with the Republican politics? Well, let's start with Billy Graham. I mean, I, I don't see how anyone could say that he was... Um, sort of leaning towards the Democrats because he, um, his, his best friend was, was Richard Nixon. And, um, and he admired Eisenhower too greatly. And his, his, um, his politics at the time uh, were certainly aligned with, with Republicans. Um, uh, um, I mean, politics in terms of foreign, foreign policy and, uh, and, um, uh, domestic policy, the economy, for example. Um, you know, he was, he was a very much a you know, free enterprise man. And um, um, I, so I, I, think he, I think he didn't call himself a Republican, of course, and he, didn't, he never endorsed a president, absolutely, but he, he, he came as close as you could get to endorsing Nixon. And he stayed with Nixon um, right through Watergate, because um, he, he was so loyal to him. Most Northern uh, evangelicals were Republicans all along, just like um, most Northern um, liberal Protestants. I mean, they, it was the party of Lincoln for them, you know, and it had, had, it had just gone, uh, come right down through the, through the, uh, through, through the decades. Um, uh, the South, of course, voted Democratic, but, uh, but it was more conservative than the North at that point, um, or at any point. Um, and uh, so the, um, the, 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 the realignment had to do, first of all, with the realignment of the South after the Civil Rights Acts of 1964-65. And, um, uh, and then to... Um, a lot of evangelicals. Um, it also the, the the sort of the events of the '60s, the so-called '60s. You know, with meaning um, protests against the Vietnam War as a, and a kind of social re revolution on campuses and so on. I mean, that drove a lot of um, uh, it, it created a real backlash. Um, uh, and um, um, uh, then uh, Jerry Falwell in um, through, through the 70s um, and 
ending up in, in 1980, um, you know, uh, spoke against um, uh, this, this, uh, this, uh, this, this cultural shift in, in, in uh, um, among, you know, on co college campuses and so on. Um, and uh, I think th and that became the kind of centerpiece of, uh, of the, the reason that uh, um, he led people into the Republican Party uh, and for Reagan. Um, but he was also, if you read his, his kind of manifesto for, um, his, for the moral majority, there's a lot in it about, about um, um, national security and economics. Um, and he, that's very Republican. It's very right-wing Republican. Um, and uh, so, you know, it, it, I think that, um, um, you know, the, the leaders of the uh, Christian right and subsequently um, try to focus their message on, on um, strictly evangelical concerns. Um, um, but uh, in, in practice, um, behind it was, was also this rather um, conservative economics and uh, national security issues. I mean, Billy Graham, after all, started his, his uh, career with them. Um, um, uh, doom and gloom about, uh, about uh, the Soviet Union and the atom bomb. Francis Fitzgerald, can I ask you to just to clarify a few points or hover over that with me? So um, I'm, I understand that you see the development of the Christian right as a natural progression in the wake of the fundamentalist modernist conflict, uh, and that very well may be the case. Can I just ask to check a few? I, I, don't, see, see it as quite, I don't see it as quite so natural. Okay. Right? Okay. Nothing, nothing need happen, you know. I mean, things could have gone another yes. way. Help me think this through. I'm just thinking out loud with you. I'm thinking of um, Billy Graham did show a deep friendship for Democratic pres presidents, probably the, the most, the closest relationship. And I'm thinking of Grant Wacker's America's right. Pastor, a book on Billy Graham. Um, uh, in that text, we see Billy Graham having very deep relationships with Democratic presidents like Lyndon Bain Johnson, I think of, um, I well, think what, of Billy Graham. Only Johnson, I think. Only Johnson. Only Johnson. He never got along very well with Kennedy. Um, but um, Johnson really, um, with his extraordinary uh, um, ability to sort of pull people into his orbit, would do things like, you know, mm. um, inviting um, Billy Graham uh, to spend the weekend, the one weekend in which he could have um, come out against uh, 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 Johnson. And um, Johnson has a way of sort of enfolding, had a way of enfolding people in his large um, grip. And, uh, and I think that that's what happened to, to Graham. Uh, Graham liked powerful people. He liked, he had friends on both sides of the aisle in Congress. Um, but um, they tended to be the, 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 uh, the more conservative ones, whether they were Democratic or Republican. This is Fitzgerald. Uh, Billy Graham, as he's founding Christianity Today in 1956, he says that his goal in doing so is to plant a flag in the middle of the road. Billy Graham wants to advocate for a doctrinally conservative kind of evangelicalism, but a socially progressive kind of evangelicalism. In your view, did Graham succeed in redirecting the movement? Well, I'm not sure that that's, that's exactly the case. I mean, he, um, he, he did, doctrinally, um, it, he was sort of slightly to the left of, I mean, he was to the left of the fundamentalist for sure. But mainly, um, he objected to the fundamentalist um, because of their, of their inability to get along with anyone else. Um, their, uh, their narrowness, their bigotry, often on in, in issues of, uh, of civil rights. Um, and um, he, wanted, he wanted a much larger base than, than for evangelicalism than, than fundamentalism allowed. So he finally um, absolutely um, dismissed the fundamentalists and uh, he, he created his own movement. But the fact is he wasn't 
himself very interested in doctrine. Um, he left that to his friends um, uh, in the seminaries. Um, he was preaching to large crowds of people. And so his messages tended to be um, about uh, their, their, their concerns, um, you know, how to run a family, um, um, how to be patriotic, how to be uh, uh, a true American. Uh, and he was, again, very close to uh, Eisenhower and Nixon on, 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 on that score. He, I mean, there, there, you know, he always saw that way, that kind of division there. But what, and he was socially progressive in that, in that um, he wanted to expand the base um, uh, um, and make it much larger. And he, he did that. And um, uh, he called himself an evangelical because he didn't like the fundamentalist name. And um, you know, gradually uh, um, those those. Uh, scholars associated with him um, did, did uh, um, uh, change doctrinally somewhat. Um, none of them ever became very socially progressive, though, in the sense of, of, um, of um, uh, wanting social justice. Um, the, the, uh, for the civil rights movement, for example, I mean, Billy Graham could have had a huge influence um, uh, in, in um, pushing the civil rights movement along. In fact, uh, Johnson asked him to um, many times, uh, but he, he wanted to stay in the middle. He mm -hmm. didn't want to alienate his Southern base or his Northern base. So he would, um, um, he did desegregate his own crusades. Um, uh, and that was, uh, that was um, important, but, um, he never really helped Martin Luther King in his crusades. Um, and he, he uh, was always very cautious about uh, uh, talking about, about civil rights. Thank you for those comments. This is Fitzgerald in uh, a chapter in your book titled The Thinkers of the Christian Right, you showcase the career and writings of R.J. Rushdani and Francis Schaeffer. What do you consider to be the uh, enduring legacy of R.J. Rushdani? Rushdani is um, was so far out, <laughs> you know. I mean, he he was a um, uh, among other things believed in the sort of Confederate um, um, uh, notion of of um, social life. A uh, um, hundred years after the end of the war. Um, and uh, he uh, he was he also thought to create an entire um, um, new gospel. I mean, he wrote a, re, huge tomes on um, uh, called, and one was called the Institutes, in, which was in uh, uh, in, in an homage, if you want, to to the Reformation Institutes of, the, of Calvin, and. Um, uh, but I think, um, you know, uh, he, he, had, he had this view that um, 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 real civilization would, would uh, uh, come when, when um, humans on earth um, uh, obeyed, uh, acted um, exactly as the Bible taught them to, um, including Deuteronomy, you know. Um, and uh, uh, the idea that, um, um, you could stone people to death or, um, that, that, um, children, um, uh, could be, you know, mistreated by their parents and so forth. It was just not, not on. And so a lot of people, um, uh, uh, simply dismissed the whole thing, um, his whole, his whole work. But, um, there were elements of it that, that sort of, circulated without, without much connection to the rest of it. And um, I, I think, practically speaking, um, the element that um, um, took hold was his um, struggle to uh, uh, get, um, uh, expand um, Christian schools and um, the, the notion that um, you could be schooled entirely outside of the mainstream outside of the public school system. 
Mm. You also showcase Francis Schaeffer, who's a character whom I have heard of. Uh, Francis Schaeffer, how did he influence the Christian right? Uh, oh, quite a lot. I mean, in many, many ways. But um, I, I think probably the, the most prominent thing one could put one's finger on, as opposed to, you know, a lot of doctrinal issues, um, was abortion. I mean, he really started the anti-abortion movement among evangelicals. And he did it in the face of a good deal of protest because um, uh, evangelicals and, and uh, liberal Protestants alike thought of, um, um, uh, you know, pro-life um, uh, doctrines as being t totally Catholic, uh, and it had been. Um, and pro most Protestants had been for um, certain kinds of abortion. They, I mean, no, nobody was ever for for um, uh, you know abortion on demand as they called it, but rather um, they had such um, uh, wide um, uh, limits on on it that it was almost that in the sense that um, uh, the, the notion of um, um, uh, you know that you, you you could have an abortion if it would save the mother's life, well they they would extend that to the mother's life and happiness. And um, so that, that would, could mean almost anything, you know. Um, it could mean, um, um, you know, her, her convenience, if you want. So it almost came down to um, uh, um, uh, on abortion on demand. But um, Francis Schaeffer teamed up with them um, the guy who later became the Surgeon General for, for Reagan. Um, and uh, they made a film. Um, uh, actually, the film was made by Schaefer's son, Frankie, and um, who was very anti-abortion. And, and uh, Schaefer himself worried about it because he thought he might not bring everybody along on it. He thought it might be very unpopular. And, um, but it was very dramatic. And uh, it showed, um, um, you know, the horrors of the moment of abortion, you know, um, very vividly. And uh, uh, it showed this um, quite wonderful um, pediatric surgeon um, having saved the lives of, uh, of um, uh, many people who otherwise would have been given up for, I mean, babies who might have been given up for dead. Um, so. Uh, it happened slowly, um, but this film got it got around, and um, after a while, um, it went to pastors, and pastors um, uh, started beginning to preach uh, um, anti-abortion uh, uh, messages. And um, but it really wasn't until late in the '80s that the majority of um, um, pastors were were preaching this um, so much later than people think. Uh, and it certainly wasn't the reason for um, the rise of the Christian right, because um, that had a lot to do with the school system, um, with um, uh, Christian schools, uh, which the federal government wanted to uh, integrate. Um, and uh, the, there was a great deal of resistance to that. Um, but and a lot of other things, I, you know. But it was was a social sort of social um, uh, chaos, as they saw it, that that uh, really did it, and not not abortion. Francis Fitzgerald. Ever since the mid nineteen eighties, journalists and the Christian public have speculated on who the next Billy Graham might be. In point of fact, there never was uh, the next Billy Graham. What do you believe to be the future of the evangelical movement now that Billy Graham? who, as far as I'm aware, was the only figure in the 20th century to hold together evangelicalism's sprawling institutions and constituencies, now that Billy Graham is dead. Well, you know, you mustn't forget Oral Roberts, because um, he uh, brought together a whole, the other side, um, which was the Pentecostal side of the, of the movement. And uh, Billy Graham hadn't much to do with them until very late on. And actually, he was persuaded probably by Oral Roberts. Um, so while, while um, 
you know, on, on a sort of more intellectual level, Billy Graham would have been seen as the one, but, but Oral Roberts was, uh, was, was tending towards, um, it was tending people who um, spoke in tongues and did things like that, which people thought were, were sort of um, odd and uh, um, not quite uh, Christian. And, um, and also the poor, because it, um, uh, Pentecostals were, were at that point much poorer than, uh, than other people in the country. Um, I, I don't, I don't think there'll be another Billy Graham, at least for a very long time. Why? Because um, um, the Christian right has so polarized um, uh, uh, Protestants that um, uh, they're not going to come back together again um, for a long time for anybody. And you can't preach. If you preach that, you wouldn't be listened to, I think. The final chapters of your book, which are titled The New Evangelicals, and then the transformation of the Christian right, you report evangelicalism's break with Republican politics, at least partial break. What caused the death of the Christian right, to use Rick Warren's terminology? Well, I don't think it's died. I mean, I think you find it quite um, powerful here and there. There's just no one leader. And, you know, it has splintered in the way that um, uh, it's typical for Protestants to splinter off into in different denominations, um, it's it's a, a normal thing, but um, uh, you know, once um, we lost um, um, uh, Pat Robertson and James Dobson, um, really there was no one uh, person or group. The um, the powerful Christian right groups now are ones that are simply run by. Um, executives, you know, they're they're not run by charismatic preachers. Um, there are plenty of uh, Christian right um, groups locally in states and and uh, and uh, cities and so forth, or mostly the countryside. Um, but um, um, what happened? What did happen in in, in um, just around uh, two thousand and five? was that um, a, uh, a liberal group appeared. I mean, liber liberal, I'm talking, um, uh, this is probably the wrong word, but um, a, a group fo focused on social justice issues emerged. And uh, they, that, they were called the new evangelicals because they, well, while they were conservative on, on what they called below the belt issues, um, they, uh, they tended to be for, um, uh, recognize climate change um, and uh, have a, um, a, a deep uh, um, commitment to the poor, uh, both here and abroad. Um, and that was not the only things, but that, but, uh, um, and I, I think they doctrinally became less, less, less conservative. Um, but um, some of them were, were, um, um, uh, serious scholars. Um, so, you know, there was a the doctrinal element was certainly there. And um, uh, maybe they make up the 20% now that didn't vote for, for uh, uh, Donald Trump, but um, the, um, uh, the 80% that did is, uh, shows that, uh, that their, their, their influence was limited. And um, uh, Similarly, with this just past election, 75% voted Republican. I think what the, the Christian right is not dead, but it's become, it's, it's, it's not less a movement now than it is a kind of interest group. And um, uh, um, they, they have become um, a bit cynical. Um, they have decided that, uh, that um, character doesn't count so much in the president as it does um, uh, what, they, what they actually accomplish for, for the Christian right. Um, and uh, uh, they have power because, um, uh, because of this 80% of evangelicals. And um, essentially, they're the base for, for Donald Trump. I mean, 
uh, look, he's done in more for, for them than any, any other president um, uh, since 1980. And um, um, he, he has to because they're his base. So um, what, what change will come is in the future, really. It's with the younger people whom I, I'm always told by all, all kinds of sources um, are, are, that are much more um, socially justice minded than their parents. And they haven't, didn't go through the, um, um, the, the battles of the culture wars, you know. Um, they, they kind of come out the other side. Um, plus, the addition of, of tremendous numbers of Latinos, um, not just by immigration, but by, by, by because they have um, more children than others. Um, you know, a lot of these things are, are, are demographic in, uh, in their nature. Um, um, the uh, uh, the uh, liberal Protestants um, started losing members first, and um, they have you know, precipitously lost members. But the um, evangelical groups are starting to lose members, in particular the Southern Baptist Convention, which keeps very good statistics. And uh, um, uh, even, even while they, I think a third of them are, are um, Latino, Asian, and other um, groups uh, that, uh, churches that have allied themselves with the convention. Um, there are also Latino members in white churches. And um, this eventually is going to change uh, the character of, of those denominations. And eventually, um, it will change the politics of the country because the Latinos don't vote very much, and nor do the young. So it's older people who, who have the clout right now. And um, um, so we are going to have to wait, wait and see. Hmm. Francis Fitzgerald, I'm very grateful for your time today. If I could close the interview with a question that we've been asking all participants in this interview program, and that is this, what would it mean for the church today to be united? How would we recognize this unity? And what is it that we can do as Christians to pursue the unity for which Jesus prayed in John 17? Um, well, you know, I think it would have to come down to something fairly simple because, you know, nobody, you know, Catholics, Protestants, etc., are not going to agree on doctrine. Um, they're not going to, you know, evangelicals are not going to accept the Pope. Um, uh, it's, it's not going to happen in, a, in any sort of a really tangible fashion. Um, and uh, it, Again, people argue over doctrine like crazy. They love to do it. Um, and uh, so that it won't happen on that level. But it might happen, as I say, on the simplest possible level. Let's say, love thy neighbor as thyself. Um, even that can uh, have various interpretations because you don't always know whether the person that you're trying to love um, likes your kind of love. <laughs> I mean... I'm thinking of this poor, unfortunate uh, missionary who was killed on, uh, you know, by the natives of a very small island in the Indian Ocean. I mean, he, he really believed that he was bringing the gospel and bringing love to these people. They saw him as an intruder who spoke gibberish. He didn't speak their language. They didn't speak his. And, um, uh, you know, the, um, a gift of, of um, I don't know, a scissors or, you know, it's, it's just not going to convince them um, to open their island up to strangers. And it wouldn't matter who, who it was, but uh, uh, the, the, um, I, it, it, this missionary was so, so um, um, imbued with this, with this, the importance of spreading the gospel that he, um, he, he um, essentially uh, um, uh, committed suicide by, by, uh, by um, going and, and uh, 
and and invading their well-known uh, uh, their island but their, and their well-known antipathy to strangers um, so uh, as I say um, love thy neighbor doesn't always <laughs> kind of work but but it would have to be something simple to unite the churches um, and I, I you know in a way um, they would be doing it in the face of a growing secularization um, you know even in the United States um, nearly a quarter of uh, Americans are are without a church and um, this is a, uh, a big increase in just a, a few years um, plus as I say I think I think the Christian right has made people more secular um, in the sense that they're worrying about outcomes they're not worrying about how you do things um, and who is going to do them and uh, uh, you know a lot of people think their their view of Christianity isn't exactly what what one wants um, um, but but even if you take the, their their view as as being the right one they're still um, um, becoming very much more secular in their approach to government. It's been our tremendous privilege today to be speaking with Francis Fitzgerald, journalist and Pulitzer Prize winning author, and also the author of the text that we've been speaking about today, The Evangelicals, The Struggle to Shape America, available from Simon & Schuster. Francis Fitzgerald, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you.